Good morning. Good morning. Some things in life are worth fighting for. Most things aren't, but some things are. The Bible tells us we are to fight the good fight of faith. And the Bible tells us there are a lot of good things to fight for. We should fight for our families. We should fight for, at times, our, our nation. We should fight for what is right. Uh, uh, sometimes not necessarily what is rightfully ours. Sometimes we just need to give up on some things and, and move on. But there are some things in life that are worth fighting for. And in the same vein, some things in life are worth arguing about. <coughs> And I know the Bible tells us that we've got to be careful about what we are arguing about. There are some things that are foolish and vain, and we need to avoid those. And, and Paul's letters to Timothy talks about foolish and vain questions about genealogies and stuff that don't make any difference. doesn't matter who our parents are or were. As to whether we are the children of God or not, doesn't matter whether we're Jew or Gentile. Those things just there's don't even argue about those things. The argument in that in, in that vein is about uh, you know do we believe and do we obey? You know that's that's the primary point. But there's something to be said about arguing to discover the foundations of truth and to discover truth and what the Bible is telling us about truth. And maybe the problem is we haven't defined argument the right way because I, I know that most people say, well, you know you shouldn't argue. They're talking about what goes on in politics maybe. Or they're talking about what kids do, about what TV program to watch. I don't know. I guess adults do that too, don't they? Or, or you know, just, just things. You know, where to go and eat or what to eat. Stuff like that. No. Here's a definition of argument. A form of expression consisting of a coherent set of reasons presenting or supporting a point of view a series of reasons given for or against a matter under discussion that is intended to convince or persuade the listener. Not just to browbeat somebody into doing what you want them to do. An argument is something to persuade somebody about the truth. About the truth. About what is truth. And, and there's two sides to it also, right? Uh, don't always assume that the person that you're talking to doesn't know what they're talking about. Assume that maybe they know something. Maybe maybe they have a little handle on truth too, and, and their little handle on truth and your little handle on truth being brought together, you can discover some, some truth that's there. And that's what arguing, argumentation, can do. It can be very helpful. And, you know, there's another word that you can throw in there. It's called debate. When it's done properly, it's really good for discovering truth. And, but persuading people, convincing people about things, well, I think that's what John does in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Listen to this. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God has, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So I think what John does in this passage, look, John builds an argument for God's love being the kind of love we ought to have for one another. It's an argument. 
It's an argument based on some evidences that he presents and then he draws a conclusion and he puts that conclusion right out there to us. What a wonderful thing. See, he's not arguing about what to have for dinner. He's not arguing for the sake of arguing. He's not arguing to say, my way is better than your way. My opinion is better than your opinion. No, he's trying to get to a very vital truth that each and every one of us needs to really understand. So let's just start, let's break it down into what John is saying. Number one, he said, listen, this is what he says, love is from God. In particular, the love that he is talking about. And to understand the passage, you've got to understand just specifically what he's talking about because we have a problem with translation, don't we? Uh, we were talking about literal and figurative, and we're talking about how to study the Bible, but you've also got a translation problem, because in the English, we use the word love in a particular way, and uh, in the Greek, they had several words that are translated into the English as love. And we got to be careful how we use them because we can get confused about which one is being used in which particular passage. What is John talking about here? Well, John uses the Greek word agape, which is translated into English as love, but it's not the only Greek word that's translated as love. But we need to go back and we've got to see, oh, what is this agape love that, that John is talking about here? Well, that's where somebody's done some work for us, right? There are various dictionaries out there that, that look at the Greek words, and yeah, you probably, you might have some even in your homes. This, this comes from vines. And it's the Exhaustive Dictionary of New Testament Words. That's what that E-D-N-T-W stands for down there. If you go to love, you find under this particular agape of the Greek word, um, Vine says it's Christian love, whether exercised toward the brethren or toward men generally is not an impulse from the feelings. Hey, what, what does he mean there? Take the emotion out of it. It's not about emotions. There are other words in the Greek that talk about love as an emotion. This is not about emotion. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. It's not, I don't love you because I like you. Okay? <laughs> That's not what it's talking about here. Love seeks, or this type of love, seeks the welfare of all, according to Romans chapter 15 and verse 2, and works no ill to any, regardless, according to Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. So what you see here is that this love is a rational love, a love of reasoning. It's a way of loving that we choose to participate in because God has given it to us as a gift for being his children. Love is from God. That's what John says right up there in the front. This love, agape, is from God. You don't get it from the world. <coughs> you probably don't get it from your parents. You don't pass it down through your genetics. Okay? You get it from God. God gives it to you kind of as a gift. This love is from God. So when we choose not to do good or do what uh, not to do what is right to someone or anyone then we follow the course that leads us away from God can we understand that when we choose not to agape to rash <coughs> when we make a rational to see decision that says I'm not going to do good to GW because I, I don't like the looks on his face. 
Okay. Then I have chosen to walk away from God's way of loving. And it could be whatever reason, see? What, whatever reason it is. I choose not to do good. But that's not what God does. That's not how God operates. But I've chosen a course. A course of action. And that's the rational nature of it. I may have made that because of an, an emotional decision. I just don't like him. Okay? I just don't like him, so I'm not going to do good. That's the wrong reasoning, see? That's where Jesus, when he talked about love your enemies. Do good to those who abuse you and hurt you. Oh, that's a tough thing to do, Jesus. Yeah, but that's what God does. And that's what Jesus did. And that's the pattern he sets out because it's not an emotional decision. It's a rational choice that we make because we have become the children of God. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, the very first part of that, John says, anyone who does not love does not know God. And again, it's that agape, right? Anyone who does not agape choose to do good to somebody and the reason that one who chooses <coughs> not to love or agape is moving away from God is because the very nature of God is love or agape or let's extend it just a little bit more if you're looking at the King James Version it's the word charity isn't it but that takes us to the next verse, doesn't it? Because God is love. God is agape. His whole persona, his whole character. Now, you, you, you understand, because this is figurative, isn't it? Because God is more than love. So God is a spirit, right? But God is love. It's telling us about God. It's describing God. It's telling us about His character. This is how He acts. And boy, that's pretty definite, is it? Isn't it? God is love, and in Him is no non-love. Wait, wait a minute. Doesn't God hate certain things? Do you go to Proverbs chapter 6, and doesn't He hate those who sow discord among brethren? Well, yes, He does, but you have to understand uh, he would still do them good if what? If they repent. If they turn back. It's just not that he cuts them off and there is no opportunity. Well, if they die in that condition, they've, they've set their own course because they've chose not to be like him, loving, agape, a charitable individual. Individual. So, God does not just love us God is the perfect example of agape love the perfect example he has chosen to deal with us through love us you you and me <laughs> undeserving you and me right hey go back in your own mind and just think about how undeserving Amen. you are because I can do that I can do I can go back and think how undeserving I am right and that makes me appreciate it even that much more. Man without God's inspiration cannot conceive of a God who is totally kind and good. But did you ever notice? Uh, what, what do some of the, the Bible scholars do? And, and a, lot, a lot of theologians and people, well, you know, the, the, the God of the Old Testament, he was very strict and he was very mean and he was vindictive, but the God of the New Testament, he's very loving and kind and gracious. Right? Are they reading the same Bible that we're reading? No. <laughs> because it's the same God. It's the same God. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. What's the difference? They didn't obey Him. 
they brought that vindictiveness on themselves. And it really wasn't vindictiveness, it was judgment. The grace was there the whole time. Think about Cain. Cain, if you will do what's right, you will be accepted. I'm not going to do what's right. In fact, I'll show you, God. I'll kill Abel. Then what are you going to do? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. See how God, God tried and tried and <coughs> tried. And think what he did. He sent his only begotten son to the cross to save those people <coughs> as well as us. So we, we have a hard time, even people who believe in God have a hard time imagining the true nature of God, the agape love of God. See? Think about the invented gods that Paul talks about, Romans chapter 1, right? If you want to keep God in their imagination, that, that, that God who was so good that he created man, put him in paradise. Okay? And when he fell, when, when man fell, yeah, God says, you know, you can't live in paradise here anymore because if you eat of the tree of life, continue to eat of, of it, you, you're going to be in a falling condition. That, that's not going to be good. So you got to go out here so that I can redeem you to bring you back into a place where you can eat of the tree of life and live forever. See, that is that what the book of Revelation kind of talks about? That then... In the future, we'll have, again, access to the tree of life. You, you read it. That's just now out so that he can redeem us and bring us back. He had to set the conditions for us to come back. Okay? But, but there it is. So after they get separated from God, what do they do? They invent their own gods. And what kind of gods did they invent? Did they invent good gods? Loving gods, kind gods, like God truly is? No, they invented some pretty mean, nasty gods, didn't they? Go back and look at <coughs> what the Greeks and the Romans did. Hey, how about those volcano gods, right? The volcano rumbles, and what do you do? Throw a virgin in the volcano. If it quits rumbling, hey, that's what we need to do, just throw a virgin in every now and then, right? If it keeps rumbling, what? Throw another virgin in, right? Run out of virgins, you know, eventually. But meanness, judgment, who invented that? It wasn't from God. It was what men invented. You see what I'm saying? Man couldn't come up with this. What, what God is, and that's why John, I believe, is making this argument. That love, agape love, is from God because God is love. That's his character. Not what you've heard of him from people, what they've made up, maybe even what the devil tried to get you to believe because, hey, that's what the devil is. The devil's destructive. Okay? God is not like those volcano gods. Wouldn't it be great if he was, you know, you do a little bit of something wrong and he, he rumbles and gives you a warning. God doesn't operate like that, does he? he? He gives us his word. He expects us to use our minds to go and study. And when we use our minds to study, if we have any type of a mind and a heart, we have a conscience. And our conscience says, I'm not right with God, so I've got to, I, I, I've got to change here. God op doesn't operate by fear. He operates by love and truth in the hearts of men. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 18-21 says this, Little children, 
Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, okay, when is our heart going to condemn us? Well, if we have knowledge of what is right and wrong from God's word, we have a proper conception of God, we know what God expects, and we know by our conscience whether we've done right or wrong. So, whenever our heart condemns us, we know that we've done wrong. God is greater than our heart. I know I've done wrong, but God can take care of that problem, can't he? How can he take care of that problem? Through forgiveness. Through his love, through his agape love, he can forgive us. He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Well, how do I get my heart not to condemn me? Because I know I've done wrong. I know I'm a sinner. I know I continue to do things wrong. How do I get my heart not to condemn me? I gotta keep asking for forgiveness. I just gotta keep going back over and over again to a gracious God who doesn't operate out of fear, <coughs> but operates out of love. Who says, says to me, says to you, if your brother sins against you and comes and repents, how often do you forgive him? Seven times? Seventy times seven, right? Does that mean once I get to 490 times, I don't have to forgive him anymore? No, no. <laughs> See, that's figurative language, isn't it? How often would God forgive us? If we truly, truly are seeking his repentance and asking with a true heart. Not just, oh God, I sinned again. Forgive me. I want to do it tomorrow. Forgive me again. Are we really working on it? So we see how God operates the warning signs get, God gives us are the feelings of our own hearts. And if our hearts condemn us, we know we've got to go a little bit further. We've got to do a little bit more. God is love, and one of the gifts he has given us out of his love is a conscience. But you know, the Bible tells us a conscience can be seared over, right? You know what seared over is? It's those old cowboy movies, right? You ever see those old cowboy movies? Somebody gets shot, right? They get it in the arm or whatever. What do they do? They dig that bullet out and then somebody gets the poker, gets it white hot, just and they sear it over. And the Bible says some people's consciences are like that. And sin will do that to us if we're not careful. It'll callous it over to the point where God's love can't even get through. So we've got to be careful. A conscience God gives us. Our confidence in God will be related to how well we know in our hearts that we have chosen to be like Him. And a part of that then becomes the evidence, right? The evidence in our lives that we can see of how close we are walking to him. Do we have agape love in our lives? Are, are, are we making those rational choices choosing to do good to others? And when our conscience tells us our love is not properly motivated and properly revealed, then our conscience is condemning the choices we have made, right? God doesn't have to do it because if our conscience is is true and active, it's telling us. God doesn't have to. The volcano God doesn't have to rumble. God doesn't have to rumble. We've got a rumbling that goes on inside us that will tell us. 
So what is God's love like? The character of God's love is seen in the fact that God loved us. And that's what John says, John chapter 4, verse 10. We cannot limit God's love to only Christians because the gifts God has made available to us are also available to the whole world. How do we know that? John chapter 3 and verse 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in him, you shouldn't perish. You should exercise that right to become a child of God by becoming by being born again of water and spirit through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's that simple. That's how much God loves us. How much does God love us? Well, enough to risk the temptations of this world and the flesh to come and die on the cross for us. Right? Uh, you think of it. Christ emptying himself as God the Word and becoming a human being took upon himself the danger in becoming a human being of sinning and being eternally lost. That's a danger, wasn't it? When you think of the Christ emptying himself, he took the risk of falling. The perfect life is what made the death of the perfect one the great show of love that it was just that little bit more to understand the depth of that love, the risk that he ran for us. So, there you have evidence. What, 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 what is the evidence John uses? Number one, love is from God. Number two, God is love. Number three, God loved us. Yes, even weak, pathetic, you and me. I, I know. So what's the conclusion? What's the argument then that he makes? Right there, boom. If God so loved us, then we ought also to love one another. That's an argument. It's not a question. Well, if God so loved us, shouldn't we also love one another? That's not the question. He didn't ask a question. He says, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's a statement, isn't it? That's a command. That's not a question. He's not asking our opinion. He's telling us something there, isn't he? But it's something very beautiful. It's something very good and noble. If God, the supreme being he is, can choose to love such sinful creatures as you and me, who are so far beneath, beneath him, you know what? We ought to be able to love one another. And to love our enemies. Yeah, even our enemies. That's a love worth arguing about, or arguing for, right? I hope you agree with that. Amen. That's the end of the lesson. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and your attention. If you have a need this morning, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the